I'm going to go ahead and get this up and running here in just a minute. I thought about giving, giving every one of you a microphone, and uh, that way you can sing out really, really loud, and uh, everyone can hear you. That way I won't be the only one that uh, has a microphone on, and we'll just have a choir, right? And be like you're in a choir loft, but you get to do it from your seats. Amen. Habakkuk chapter 3 is where we'll be tonight, and uh, just a couple of verses, what I, want to, I want to look at the first two verses and the last two verses, believe it or not. Uh, Habakkuk, uh, I don't know where to tell you, to, uh, I know in the Schofield Bible it's always, I used to hear Doc Childs because he was a Schofield Bible kind of guy, and he would always say, turn to page 973. And I'm like, just tell me what book we're in. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, if you got a Schofield Bible, it's 957, by the way, not 973. But uh, anyway, uh, one of these uh, neglected uh, Old Testament minor prophets, so to speak. And uh, to believe it or not, when I've been reading through and studying uh, in preparation for the message for tonight... Uh, the things that I've been reading, I, I'm surprised that I haven't preached on it before because just the things that are just popping up out of it, I'm like, man, I need to preach through this book. But uh, we've been going through the prayer meetings over in uh, Acts, been talking about uh, even in the Gospels where God says, my house should be a house of prayer. And then we've been looking at the, uh, the reasons why we have prayer meetings through the book of Acts. And we'll continue on that next week. Uh, Lord willing, but I uh, just wanted to do something different for tonight and preparation for the revival meetings. I want to move my uh, little desk up here and uh, we'll go ahead and read from here. Habakkuk chapter 3, a prayer for revival. It says this, it says, A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet upon Shiganoth. I hope I pronounced that right. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, thy, uh, of the years, in the midst of years make known, and wrath remember mercy. Well, let's drop down to the last two verses because these are, these are really good. Um, and just look at the last two. I want to concentrate on the second verse more than anything else. But the last two says, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and He will make my feet like hinds feet, and He will make me to walk upon mine high places to the chief singers on my stringed instruments. And uh, Shiganoth, I believe, is a stringed instrument, and uh, something that uh, they would put to song. And uh, so anyway, that's where we'll be tonight. I'm just looking at those verses, and uh, let's just pray for the message as we get ready. Heavenly Father, Lord... Calm my mind. Lord, help my speech to be clear. And Lord, help us to get a hold of you. Lord, we pray for those who can't be here for tonight. And Lord, there's a lot of things that are going on in my heart. Things I'm praying for. And I think of Miss Claire Chapman and others that are going through tough situations. Mr. Swain and several others. Lord, as I think of what's going on in America, Lord, we are uh, in a place where we need revival, not only for our church, but for our country, for our families. Lord, we just need a period, and we just thank you. We thank you for what you've shown us from your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you have a blue letter app like I do, anybody got one of those? I know you guys don't use that kind of stuff, but... Uh, got a blue letter, la blue letter app on my phone and I use it quite often, particularly when I'm uh, preparing for messages and maybe I'm at, over at the house and I'm not at a computer or whatever. And I'm able to go over there and scroll through and look up words, how many times that a word is mentioned or uh, even what it means in uh, Greek, Hebrew, whatever the case may be. And uh, many times I can't pronounce the words in the first place, so I need all the help that I can get. But in the blue letter Bible app, uh, I'll go through and I, I typed in there revival and just trying to go through the Bible, the whole Bible, I searched the whole course of it there on the Blue Letter Bible app and you want to know how many times did you find the word revival in your Bible? None, that's right. That's incredible. You know we talk about revival all the time and it's not even mentioned the word revival but when we type in the word revive it's mentioned eight times in seven different verses and it's not that it's not there, it's just that, uh, you know, if you type in the word revival, it's not there. And, and of course, uh, it's, it's not just in the word. 
uh, in several different places, several different ways. It mentions revival throughout all the Bible, I believe. And uh, so though it may not mention the word, like it doesn't mention the word Trinity in the Bible, but yet we, we, we understand that that's a Bible doctrine, a Bible teaching. And uh, so, you know, I learned through here that uh, the spirit of revival is still very much something that uh, the Bible speaks about over and over again. Over in Jeremiah chapter 18, we think of the potter's vessel where he sends Jeremiah down to look in the house of this potter. Now, it seems kind of strange to me he's going to look through some strange guy's window. But nonetheless, he tells him to go down and look through the window and watch the potter at work. And as it's tear down and, and, and is marred in the potter's hand, maybe a rock or maybe a bubble or something was in there. And it got marred in his hand and it's sort of like fell all the pieces. And he says, can I remake it again? And, and we would understand that to be a, a revival teaching, right? And maybe we go over to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 3, where uh, we're thinking of the Laodicean church, where Jesus you know, sends out he, he, through the Apostle John, and, and John is writing to the seven churches, and that seventh church, the Laodicean church, he says, I wish you were cold or hot, but since you're not cold or hot, you're lukewarm, I want to spew you out of my mouth. And it shows me that they, they are in a desperate need of revival in their life. And constantly would tell me, I want you to go back and do those first works. And, and in several other places, he tells them, just repent and get right. And there's only two churches that he commended uh, throughout those, uh, the book of Revelation and those uh, seven churches. And so it's found in, the, uh, in those two things, Jeremiah 18, the lukewarmness in the Laodicean church. And then I think it's also like a personal thing, and I'll get into more a little bit later on, but uh, I was thinking about Jacob as I was reading through and preparing for this, the personal revival uh, that we look for in our own lives, because I, I can pray for a revival all I want to for you guys, which I do, but uh, you know, if it's not happening in my own life, then that's a problem, you know? It's, it's sort of like you're, you're sitting in a pew and you're listening to the preacher preach and you're thinking about, I'm glad this, this, this preacher's preaching this because that person over there needs it. You know what I mean? And you, and you say, well, that message is for so-and-so, but you never apply it to yourself. And Jacob, he was in the need of personal revival over and over again. I, I think to myself, Jacob's a planter and all this, and he was just a rascal, and yet he needed personal revival in his life. And I remember in, in Genesis chapter, uh, was it 32, I believe it is, where he's wrestling with God at uh, uh, the brook Jabbok. And so he's sitting in there and he's wrestling with God, and he says, what is our name? And, and he tells him, my name's Jacob. You know, and for the first time ever, he, he admits who he is, and God was able to bless him. And it's amazing. He gets back to his identity, and he takes off the disguise of trying to hide behind everybody else and blaming everybody else for his problems. And then, uh, you know, I'll spare you for the sake of time. I've, I, st I studied this for, for a long length of time just because I needed it, okay? Um, but hiding behind a disguise, so to speak. And then when he goes and he tells, God tells me, he says, I want you to prepare, I want you to go to Bethel, the same place where I met with you the first time. Remember when he made those vows to God, if you bring me back again in peace, I'll pay the tenth of what I have. And now all of a sudden, for the first time in his life, he says, look, we're going to worship God and we need to put away all of the gods. All my servants, all my sons, my wives, Put, put them all away. We can't carry them around with us any longer. And that was another step of revival for him. Not only was he uh, struggling and striving for the birthright and trying to get what he wanted all the time, but now he gets to the place where he's putting away all the gods and everything else, getting right before God. And then finally, a little bit after that, that's when he loses Rachel, his favorite wife. He loses his father, Isaac. And he loses his favorite son. All the things that were dear to him, he lost it in a matter of just a period of a couple of years. He lost them all. Those things that were near and dear to his life. And I mean, I'm sure that broke him because that's what he, that's what he strove for. You know, his father, his wife, his son. And uh, he, he thought that he found meaning in all these things. But then he got to the place of faith, got to the place of worship, got to the place of finding his identity in God. And so he had a personal revival in his life, uh, on and on. I could go about that. But revival is biblical, and this is the only place in the Bible 
where revival was sought by prayer. You know? And so when we're praying for revival over and over again, it's not, it, none, you won't find it anywhere else where they say, we need to pray for revival. And yes, when we get to Acts chapter 2 and they're up in the upper room praying and uh, waiting for the, the, the promise from God, the Holy Spirit to come down upon them, they weren't praying for revival, but that was a result of them being obedient and praying and God blessed them with the Holy Spirit. This is the only place in all the Bible where we find that uh, Habakkuk, the prophet of God, is praying for revival. And uh, it's just an amazing thing to define here. And I do believe that we ought to be praying for revival ourselves, especially in this day and hour. We ought to be praying. In fact, when we get down and we'll look at the teaching here of this just a little bit, but uh, the very fact that it says he, 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 Habakkuk is, is, a, is a priest, and uh, he is putting this together for temple worship. He is, this is a prayer that he intends to be used in the temple. This is put to a song. And you know, songs are very catchy. It's something that you know, they, they intend for people to sing over and over and over and over and over again. To be caught in the heart and in the mind that it might be something that's stuck with inside of the heart. And so not only was it a prayer, something to be used in their liturgical services, but it was put to song and it was something for the people of God. It wasn't for the lost and dying world. It was for the people of God to get a hold of. It's been well said that uh, when Christianity retreats, evil fills in the gap. And, and that's true. I mean, it's crazy. I thought to myself, I, I was with Scott Devers the other day. We were passing out revival flyers out in Chapin in a little area. And uh, we passed out 72 revival flyers. And I'm looking around. I'm going up and down the streets. Everywhere that I go, it's just uh, Halloween decorations left and right. Everywhere that I turn. And I, I thought to myself, it used to be when I would go down the streets as a little boy during Christmas time, you would find Christmas lights all up and down the streets. You, you wouldn't pass a couple miles without finding a house that had Christmas lights on it. And now today, whole neighborhoods, you go down them, you won't find Christmas lights. Maybe the excuses are too, too, uh, uh, too expensive to light up the house, but I mean, this shows you what kind of a darkness that we're living in where, where we turn into worshiping a dark holiday as opposed to a holiday of joy and light and family and peace. And it's just something that I've noticed myself. And we've spiritualized into a spiritless and joyless society. Proverbs 29.2 it's still true. It says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. Just like you said, the people mourn. And that's still true. And I mean, we got into the place where we're just like in a spiritual depression all around us. You guys agree with me, right? There's a spiritual depression. I'm sure being working in the hospital, you see that over and over and over again. Or whether you're working in the police force or whatever the case may be. But that spiritual depression there, and we talk about the financial recessions, we talk about the moral degradations, and just how nobody has any morals. I, I was blown away by the news reports I've, I've seen in the last couple of days where uh, an incident happened in Philadelphia, and I'm like, how in the world... Could something like this go on in America? And I mean, it was just detestable, gross, horrible, despicable. It made me sick to my stomach. And I'm not even going to tell you what it is. It's sort of like close to what it was in the book of Judges where that Levite and his concubine got cut up in twelve. It's that gross. And that's where we've turned to. I wish I wish that I could go into every house and just shake them <laughs> and say, wake up. Are things getting any better for you? Is this the path you really want to be on? Is this the way you want to walk? Is this the direction that you really want to head? Why don't we turn back to God? Why don't we get back into praying? Why don't we get back into the services and, and learn more about the Lord? Why don't we turn unto Him? 
How bad does it have to get before we finally wake up and say, God, I need you. I don't want to be insecure or, 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 or face the... Not insecure myself, but insecure in the world around us where you've got to be afraid somebody break into your house in broad daylight and nobody's going to do anything about it. Or somebody throw rocks into a business and they're like, sorry about your tough luck, but you got to pay for it yourself or something like this. You know, that's what does it want to take to wake people up to this? And it's just happening all the way around us and it's just becoming more and more dark instead of more and more light. The book of Romans rings true and uh, we're facing the worst sort of judgment that the people can face. And uh, God has given, you know, Romans chapter 1, where God says, I'll give them up to the uncleanness, to their lust, to do whatever's in their heart, to work out those things where, which are despicable. That's, that's what's taking place here. He says, I'll give them up unto vile affections. I'll give them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And there's certain things where he tells the individuals is what's taking place in our society all the way around us. And the worst sort of judgment is, is not necessarily sending a natural disaster our way, but to give us over to suffer from our own hands, our own wicked devices, what we're destroying ourselves. Does that make sense? And so I want to introduce you to this uh, wonderful book of Habakkuk tonight. I want to encourage you with it. And it calls us to prayer. Prayer is not our last resort, but it's our first resort as we go to the throne room of God. And Habakkuk's name means to embrace. And I think that uh, as I read through, he's embracing several things in his life. One, he is embracing God as he's trying to figure out what is going on around him. He, he looks at his very own people, Judah, and Judah has gone into all kinds of wickedness. And he said, God, aren't you going to do anything about this? And then God gives him the answer, yeah, I want to do something about it. I'll send the Chaldeans. And he's like, wait, time out. I mean, what are you, what are you talking about? The Chaldeans are worse than what's going on here in Judah. I mean, this, this can't be. How are you going to send somebody more wicked than ourselves to bring us into captivity? That doesn't make sense. And when he's sitting back and he thinks that sort of, it appears to him in such a way that God is, is in silence. It's like he, he's nowhere to be found. God, where are you when this is going on? Where is the peace and safety? God, where, is, where are you when, when we're in trouble? Where are you when we uh, just can't find the light of day? And so he prays and he says, I want to go up to the watchtower and I want to watch for an answer from God. Remember that in Habakkuk chapter 2. Not that he's going up to a physical watchtower, but in his heart as he's praying, he says, I want to wait for an answer from God. And one of the things that God shows him, he says, is the just shall live by faith. Now that's, that's something that's just for, for every Christian throughout all the Bible from beginning to end. That's what it is for us. The just shall live by faith. And what God shows him is, I will punish the wicked. But you, though you don't understand it, you just need to walk with me and trust me that I am very much at work. That I'm very much in control. And he finds at the end, that in chapter 3, he's able to rejoice. And as he prays for this revival in darkness, wondering where God is, he's able to come to the place where he understands what God is doing. And he says, revive thy people in the midst of of the years of the captivity. Seventy years they'll be there. In the midst of the darkness, revive thy people. Uh, again, so he embraces God, he embraces faith, but he's able to encourage his people through this. And uh, he ministered around the time of King Jehoiakim as they're getting ready to be taken into captivity. And he was the one, as you can imagine, was jealous for God's glory. He focuses his attention on the perfect dealings of God even in the midst of heartbreaking times that troubled the people. And he wants us to know, as many do today, what his God is doing and why he seems so silent. And as the book progresses, so does Habakkuk's faith. I believe that it would uh, do us all the world of good if we sat down and reflected on who God is and his ways and his promises. And our greatest need is for a a fresh infusion of God's divine life into the church and just really 
live once again in the fear of God. I want to move on for sake of time and uh, just break this down for you. There's again, he's a, there's a prayer, there's a psalm. The songs are very important to Israel. You know, when they crossed over the Red Sea, what did they do? They sung a song, didn't they? What was the song about? God's deliverance. In Deuteronomy 32, God teaches them another song through Moses. They sing another song. He says, repeat it in their ears so they might understand. He says, I know you guys want to depart from me, but I'll still be faithful to you. And then he teaches them another song. You know, Book of Judges, the song of Deborah, she sings a song. And it's all about God's deliverance. And all these songs are always about God's deliverance and how great our God is. And, and songs are, these songs are really encouraging. It's meant to encourage the people of God. And uh, so there's a particular lesson behind the songs and for, us to, for it to be caught and it might be remembered. And uh, so it was a prayer, a song, and uh, it was to be remembered by the people of God. Now notice the author of revival here. It says in verse 2, O Lord... I've heard thy speech. And so he repeats that twice. O Lord, O Lord. Mentions the Lord's name twice. And, and he is really the, the author of revival. You know, time and time again, we, uh, of course I put together revival services. That's what I, I hope to take place. That's what I'm praying for. That's what I encourage. I put together the revival flyers. And I said, we need to be inviting people to come out and to hear the word of God. And and we ought to be evangelizing, whether it's a revival service or not. But a revival service is not uh, particularly for them. That's a result of what uh, revival is all about. The revival service is for the people of God. But it starts with God. He is the author of revival. There's nothing that we can work up. And, you know, if I, if I do something, uh, say for instance, there's, there's been times in my short time of pastoring where somebody would come up to me and say, Pastor, don't you think you ought to say something to so-and-so? And, you know, they might have good intentions or whatever. I said, you know, you can beat people over the head all day. And they, they might conform for a short period of time. And, but if I make them to do something, it's just, they're only doing it to please me. They're not doing it to please God. And it's got to be the Spirit of God that does the work. Why? Because he's the author of revival. It's, it's not me. And if it's me, then it's going to be something that's short-lived. It's going to be something that's carnal. It's not going to be something that's going to help and edify the church at all. And, and listen to me, I, I don't want to have revival services just for the sake of the preacher. I want it to be for the sake of me and for my family and for you guys. I need revival. And it's nothing that I can do. Other, the thing that I can do is I can be obedient to the Word of God. And I can let him speak to my heart and say, God, you know what, you're right. And, and, and Lord, would you just do something? Would you reset my heart where it needs to be? Would you reset my focus where it needs to go? Instead of me trying to do things my own way, because if I do it my own way, I know one thing's for certain, I'll just fall right off the cliff. I'm just exhausting all my energies and all my efforts. Why? To collapse. I can't do that. And so revival is for us to turn to God because He is the author of revival. It's not something to be worked up, but something to be prayed down. And it's God's work and the heart of His people. And, and what man does, again, is temporary, but what God does is lasting. I, I like um, this morning as I was playing with my sons, it reminded me of Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 2, where, where the question is asked, he says, Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? And you remember, all of Jerusalem, the walls were all burned down. And they're like, how, how in the world is these walls going to be rebuilt? And I was sitting there playing with my sons, and you know they have these little forts, and I'll take off the couch cushions and throw the blankets over, as you've done for your kids when you were little, you know. And uh, so I'm setting up, you know, Elijah's, make me a puppy house, because he thinks he's a puppy. So I, I put it up for him. And uh, I like what he did to me this morning. He, you know, because Joey and you know, they ran bunks as their kids, you know. So it comes down, and I have to set it up and down and set it up. He said, "Dad, can you can you fix this for me? Dad, can you can you make it? Can you, can you put it back together? Can you build it again, Daddy?" And what is revival all about? Can you build it again, Daddy?
we we think to ourselves this our our country used to be very glorious i think that uh you, I, I still believe we live in the greatest land that there is. But a lot, a lot, lot of us long for those old, old, old times. You know, sometimes there's, look, there's, there's parts of my life that I don't want to go back to. But I, I do appreciate what has taken place in the past where, you know, you used to be very neighborly with your neighbors and spend time with them and get together the fellowships, the joy, the rejoicing, the praise, the excitement, the, the, the times of financial prosperity, the times where, where it seems like people were doing well through a lot of hard work instead of trying to look to find anybody who's willing or wanting to work. And they're like, can we get back to that once again? Well, I believe that we can. Or can we get back to the place where the church house is filled again? I believe that we can. Or can we get back to the place where it seems like the, uh, the people in the house of God are filled with the Spirit of God and there's an excitement and there's a joy once again? I believe that we can. Because God's the author of revival. He can build it again. And just like in salvation where he's done everything that he can to save a people, he's done everything that he can to revive a people. It's up to us. It's up to us. It's coming down through here and um, <clears throat> just as, again, we were reminded of Ezra and Nehemiah and the walls that were coming down. Uh, God had reminded the people that it was not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. You know, promotions, advertisements, music, men, we could try to do all that we want to make revival happen, but it's, it's got to be the work of His Spirit. So we notice, uh, uh, the, notice the author of revival, then we notice the instrument of revival. He says, I've, I have heard thy speech and was what? Afraid. It's when a believer gets alone in the presence of God and he hears his voice and trembles at his word, the revival can begin. Isaiah 66 verse 2 says this, For all those things hath my hand made, you know, he talks about the earth being his footstool and so forth. All those things have my hand made, and all those things have, have been, saith the Lord, but to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. And it was a back that shows us this very thing, as he trembles before the word of God at, at the things that he sees. Because God always punishes sin. He has to, he's a just and he's a holy God. But he also, at the same time, as he trembles at sin, he learns to trust the Savior through it all. When was the last time that we trembled at the Word of God? You ever thought about that? You know, a lot of times we'll, we'll tremble at the words of our parent, mom and dad, or say something, and you're like, you, you, you better do it, when we were real little. And uh, I really, when I was younger, I learned very much so to fear my mother. <laughs> you know, I just, I didn't play around when it came to my mom. She didn't play around either. So I'm like, yes, ma'am, I'll do it. So I knew there was repercussions afterwards. There was a time in our life, you know, where we did tremble at the Word of God. I, I believe it's got to be true for every one of you. Where there was a point in life where you was a sinner, you knew you were going to be on your way to hell unless you trusted on the Savior to save your soul because He died on the cross for every one of our sins. It, there is a consequence for, for being a sinner. I don't know about you, maybe I'm the only one, but it did cause me to tremble, knowing that there was a hell to pay. But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. Just as you fear your, your father, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, you gave reverence unto your earthly fathers. And shall we not so much more fear him who is the father of, of, of spirits and live? We ought to reverence him and, and give him all of our due respect. You know, and, and, and we got to learn to do that. Pharaoh refused to tremble at God's word, and it didn't end up so well with him. And I realized that we're not come to Mount Sinai, where the people feared exceedingly, and they quaked at the voice of Almighty God, but we come to Mount Zion, again, the book of Hebrews, as it says. But in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25, it says, See that you refuse not him that speaketh, 
For if they escape not who refused him that spake on the earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. And uh, over and over again in the book of Hebrews, he warns them about unbelief. And so much so, you see that over and over again in the house of God. Unbelief. Unbelief. And that's something that God's got to deal in your heart as well as mine. Can God? Young Samuel heard from God and, you know, it transformed that whole nation. This one young little boy grew up and heard the voice of God for a short period of time. And he says, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And next thing you know, he judges the house of Eli and he is the man in charge. And he needed to hear the voice of God. Joshua, who was led by the voice of God. You think of King Josiah, a young little boy, eight years old, ruling a kingdom. And it's when he heard the word of God and trembled. And he said, we need to rebuild the house of God and tremble at his word once again. Put out all the idols. And that's what God is calling us back to. To tremble at the word of God once more. To stand in the fear of the Lord. And then we notice the character of revival. He says, revive thy work. And uh, he says, Habakkuk didn't pray, uh, Lord, go, go deal with them heathen. They, they, they need revival over there. They, they need to be straightened out. Let, let your work be done on them. No, he says, revive thy work. You know, it tells us in Philippians 1.6, uh, being confident of this very thing, he which hath begun a good work in you. He's going to perform it into the day of Jesus Christ. We are God's work that he was referring to. It seemed like all was lost and they, they had lived a life of sin and now God had punished them and sent them into that, that time of darkness in their life. And they didn't understand a lot of what God was telling them. He said, go, go, go to the Babylonians and, and build houses and plant yourselves there. And when I'm ready, I'll come and bring you back unto myself. And they thought that uh, Jeremiah and all the other prophets were crazy when they told them this. What do you mean go in there and build houses and worship there's no normalcy. And yes, I understand that they were pilgrims and strangers in that foreign land during that time, but God was once again trying to turn their hearts to Him. Trying to turn their hearts to Him. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction for instruction in righteousness. He's got to do a work in our hearts that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It's not when things are right, but in the darkness of the night where God sends His revival. In the midst of the chastening and the trial of their faith, God did the revival. That's His work. And then notice the effects of revival. It says, In the midst of the years make known and he says in the midst of the years twice, I'm not really sure why, but he highlights that. But there's the effects of the revival to, to make known. And he's making known several things. He is making known his word. He's making known his power. He's making known uh, himself in the midst of that time of who he is and what he's doing, what he's trying to accomplish, and turning him back unto himself. He's, he's making known himself in the midst of those years. And we can say, Lord, reveal Yourself to us through an increased reverence for the study of Your Holy Word. Lord, give us hope in the midst of oppression. Lord, work a mighty revival among Your people, even during times of suffering and national decline and oppression. Lord, make known an amazing revival in the midst of those years when revival comes and God reveals Himself and the result is a consciousness of God's presence. Then, last of all, notice the motive for revival. In wrath, remember mercy. Despite knowing that uh, they deserved this. And this was the chastening hand of God. They understood the reason why. And the wrath evolved. Your anger against sin and our lives. We know that we've done wrong. But Lord, be merciful to us. Bring us back into the land where we can once again worship. Lord, turn our hearts back at you. Show us mercy. 
I know that we've messed up, and I say that almost uh, you know, all the time to God. Lord, I know that I've messed up, but please be merciful to me, a sinner. He, this was not a light thing when he's trying to teach them this song. We do need God's mercy. In 2 Corinthians, I believe it is, he, he says he's the father of mercies. In the book of Exodus, he reveals himself as a God who is gracious and merciful, long-suffering, not imputing the iniquities of the father upon the children. Or, uh, and his mercy is to a thousand generations. And he, over and over again, this is how he reveals himself as a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of grace. And he, Habakkuk appeals to that mercy. He said, God, I know. I know, but can you please show us mercy once again? Show us that abundant mercy. Lord, please show mercy. Please don't give us what we deserve, but show mercy to your sinful people. Give mercy in bringing and delivering us from the nations where we are held captive. Give us mercy in bringing us back into the land. Give us mercy in bringing us back into yourself. And the rest of the song is remembrance of what God had done as we look down through the rest of chapter 3. It recites a lot of what's going on through the the crossing of the Red Sea and God's deliverance in that. And going into the promised land over in Canaan, after the deliverance, He gives them the promise. And again, He shows them as marching through the land. It's, it's just interesting, a lot of the imagery that He pulls out from around here, even where uh, Joshua said, says to the moon, stand out still, and it stands still. And it's just to show God's great ability and deliverance in, in all this. Just... As I conclude, I, uh, I want you to go with me over to Hebrews chapter 10. There's a lot more I could say, but uh, I don't, I don't want to mess this up in not mentioning this. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37 and 38, this is actually 37 and 38 is a quote from Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. And uh, he, he begins to draw this out of the Scripture. He says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37 and 38, For yet a little while, and he that shall come, will come and will not tarry. Who's, who's he? Jesus Christ. He will come and not tarry. And now the just shall live by faith, and if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. And in other words, what he's saying, just, just like the darkness that they were going in in that 70 year of captivity, just as they were going through a trial in their life, hey, we're living in the end times, you know, just what the Apostle John says. You know, the Antichrist is already into the world. But he that shall come will come. That's what he was promising them at the end of the 70 year captivity. God will deliver his people. God will come for us. We don't have to live in fear. We don't have to uh, live in turmoil and say, what in the world is going to happen to us? And will we be okay? Will we be taken care of? God took care of his people when they were in that 70 year captivity. Look at Daniel. I mean, he, he lived in the king's palace. Look at Esther. She was the queen of uh, Ahasuerus. God took care of His people during that time. But we, we, we have to live and we must live by faith. But let us pray for revival in the midst of the dark times and say, Lord, we, we are in this time that You're speaking of. And as Habakkuk has taught us pray, Lord, let us now pray for revival and do a work within our hearts so we might be ready when You do come. We might be ready when you deliver us. We're looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. We are. And thank God that that's going to happen, but it may not happen in my lifetime. we got to be ready. It seems like there's, we can't get it any closer, and as soon as we say that, it's just, it doesn't look like it can get any closer until the Lord comes. Lord, revive your work. Send a revival and start that work in me and forgive us our sins and great mercy unto your servants. Spark revival 
and our hearts for your glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for your goodness and grace. And Lord, I pray that you would just teach us. And Lord, be with us during this time of uh, darkness. Lord, I pray that you would just send a revival. There's been several people that we've been praying for. I think of Tracy Arrowwood. Uh, I think of um, Steve and Shannon. Lord, I, I've been praying for Josh and Victoria. Um, just a list of people that we've been praying for for revival. Um, the Hamilton family that will be coming. Uh, we, we have a list of people that we're praying for, Lord. Help us not to pass up the work that you're trying to do in our hearts. Lord, as David prayed, search me and try me and see if there be any wicked way in me. Help me to be in right and stand in the way of revival that I might have it as the pastor of this church. Help me to get right. Lord, I love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.